At a local community college, students have the option of using the TI-83 graphing calculators in their STA 2023 course. About half of the population of students, students use the calculators. The data below lists the completion times for students taking the third exam in that course. At the 5% significance level, test the claim that the probability distributions associated with the two types of students are equivalent. So what we're asking here is basically to run a hypothesis test, right? That's very clear by this phrase, test the claim, right? It says test the claim that the probability distributions associated with the two types of students are equivalent. Now, this kind of phrase, we talk about the probability distributions being equivalent, that sort of thing is something we usually see in a non-parametric procedure. So what I want to do is look at the data and see if there's any hint in the problem what kind of data we're dealing with and what kind of test we should run. I believe based on this statement about the probability distributions being equivalent, that's probably a non-parametric procedure, but I want to look at the data to know which one I, can, I should use. So it looks like there's a calculator group and a no calculator group. There's no way those two groups could be connected or overlapping because the students either used the calculator or they didn't, right? So no calculators means you didn't have a calculator during the test, calculator means you did. So they're independent groups. They're separate and distinct independent samples then have been drawn from these populations. And so if it's independent samples and we want to run a good non-parametric procedure, the procedure you should use is the Wilcoxon rank sum test. So if you remember the steps to doing that, we have to, of course, come up with a hypothesis. So we're going to do that first. We're going to express the claim symbolically. And then when we're done, we're going to go and handle the data so that we can come up with our test statistic. All right, so let me just um, get a piece of paper out, and we'll begin to work it out and start expressing the claim, et cetera. OK, so let's start with the claim then for our procedure. So the claim for the Wilcox and rank sum test, a lot of times they'll just write the statement out that the probability distribution for the first population is equal to the distribution for the second population. What I want to do instead is talk about the median of the populations because, of course, if the, if the probability distributions are equivalent, so would their medians be equivalent, right? And so that's really what we're after here. So I'm going to go ahead and say that the median for population 1 is equal to the median for population 2. This expresses the idea that the two populations are equivalent, or their probability distributions are equivalent. All right, let's get HO and HA. HO, of course, is the same as the claim in this instant because the two ETAs are set equal to each other, and HO uses the equality symbol, or less than or equal to or greater than or equal to, but if it has any kind of an equal sign, then we'll assume that the um, HO and the claim are the same. Now, HA is going to be not equal to in this case, right? The opposite of equal to. All right, so you have the claim, you have HO, you have HA. At this point, we normally collect, normally collect the numbers that help us calculate our test statistics. So we call this data step. So at the 5% significance level, let's at least write that down, that alpha is 0 0.05, right? And then from there, I'd like to look at our data here, and I see that I have two independent samples. And what I want to do is realize that in order to get the um, work that we need to do for our procedure, we're going to have to come up with rank totals because the rank sum test, listen to the name of the test, rank sum test, requires us to sum the ranks for each independent sample. So I first have to rank the data, and when I'm done ranking it, I have to total up those rank sums, and then when I'm done, or total up those uh, ranks, and then when I'm done, I'll have a rank sum for each little sample. Then we'll decide which one is going to be our test statistic. I'll tell you here that the test statistic is based on the sample size, and if they have the same exact sample size, both samples, then we can use either, te either test statistic we want. It doesn't matter. So we could say for argument's sake that we'll use T1 as our test statistic, but not for any particular reason other than the fact that obviously you know we could use either one and T1 is the first one, and that's it. Okay, so let's go ahead and rank the data, and once we have the data ranked, we'll then go ahead and uh, come up with these totals. Now, because I have other videos prior to this that demonstrated the ranking technique, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to just do the ranking for us. I'll come back and show you how I did that, and then from there we can talk about um, some issues in the ranking. Like, for example, I'll do the ranks, but I won't handle the ties, so that when I come back I'll show you how the ties are handled, and you'll be able to see what the preliminary ranking looked like before I fixed the ties, and then from there we'll get the rank total. Okay, so let's go ahead and do that now. I'll show you what I did for the ranks. Okay, so since I've already done it, they're right here. And what we're looking at here when you look at this is you're seeing that basically what I did was I just 
copy down the data sets, right? And I just number them in order from the smallest number, 25, up to the largest number, which was 102. And I treated both samples as if it were just one sample of data at first to at least do the ranking. So this was the first number, then this was the next smallest, then the next smallest, then so on and so forth. And when I got to 36, I realized that these two numbers were tied. So I had two 36s basically. And you can see I circled those, right? I circled them. So what I want to do here is fix that now because the fact that I circled them, you can see that I have to go back and tackle them later because I realized there was a tie in that instance. So I'm going to have to make an adjustment to that, right? So what I'm going to do to adjust it is I'm going to say, hey, look, they can't both be different. They can't, notice it can't be 36 is 4 and this 36 gets to have the rank 5. That's not fair, right? Because they're both the same number. So why does this guy get a higher ranking than that one? Notice this rank total will have a higher number summed into it than this one will, but yet they have the same number. So that's not fair. So what I have to do is average the ranks that I gave those. So I gave one 4 and I gave the other one 5. Of course, if you add them together, you'll get 9. If you divide by 2, you get 4.5. But just so you can visually see, it'll be 4 plus 5. Then you're going to divide that by 2, and you'll get the answer 4.5. Okay, so we're going to give 4.5 to these instead of the numbers that were originally there. So I'm going to cross that out and call that 4.5. Cross this one out and call it 4.5. Okay, so let's keep in mind that that's the new rank for that value. Now you'll see I put a square box around these two values. Again, there was a tie. 82 and 82 were in both groups. And once again, it's unfair to use uh, 17 for this one and 18 for this one, right? This gives this population an unfair advantage over that one for no good reason since the 82 is the same number. So we're going to do is again cross it out and give it the average. Now, the average between 17 and 18 is 17 and a half, so we will simply say 17.5 and 17.5. Okay, so those are our results now. Now what we're going to do is total it up to get our rank totals. So let's see what happens when we add these numbers, see if we get the rank totals for our procedure. Okay, so in the case of the first population, we'll have 2 plus 3 plus 4.5 plus 12 plus 8 plus 9. Then we'll have plus 6 plus 14 plus 16 plus 17.5. And when we're done, we get the answer 92. So for the first group, the sum is 92. That means for T1, we have an answer of 92. All right, now for T2, just to have it in there for good measure, let's do it. We'll have 1 plus 7 plus 10 plus 20 plus 15 plus 13 plus 17.5 plus 11 plus 4.5 plus 19. We get 118 as our total there. So the second rank sum is 118. Now if I want to check to see if this is the correct total, you realize we had 10 values in each row that gave us 20 values total. So my total rank sum, if I added up both rank sums, should be the same as 20 times 21 divided by 2. If I do that, I get 210. Now let's check our total. If I add 92 to 118, do I get the 210 I'm supposed to get? I do. So again, as a check, you're supposed to do the n, which is the total number of values you had, times n plus 1. So the n, which in our case is 20, times n plus 1, which in our case is 21. So 20 times 21, then divide that in half. That should be the sum of these two values if you've done the ranking correctly. All right, good. So we have the rank totals as they should be. And remember, I said that we were going to use the um, value here as our test statistic, arbitrarily, right? Because we could use either, either one. So let's let T1 be our test stat. So let's say our test stat here is T1, and that's equal to 92. All right, from here, we're going to go compare this against a critical value. In order to do that, we have to have the two sample sizes, right? So critical value step is going to involve looking at we're going to look at the sample sizes so n1 is 10 n2 is 10 and then from there we're going to need alpha alpha is 0 0.05 in two tails let's keep in mind that that 0.05 is in two tails and then we have to go to our Wilcoxon rank sum table 
look up these two sample size and that alpha and two tails, and that will give us the critical value for the procedure. So remind, I want to remind you that the critical values that we get from the table um, aren't the whole story. We have to put them on a number line. So our critical values essentially are going to look like this. We'll put them on a number line. What we're going to do is say, okay, look, if we end up in here, we'll reject HO. If we end up in here, we'll reject HO. For a two-tailed procedure, our critical value is going to be T, which in this case is our T1 value. So if T is in here, reject. If T is in here, reject, right? So this will be the reject area, and this will be the reject area. And of course, that would be reject HO, reject HO. So the question is, will our test stat land here, right? So if T is here or T is here, we're going to reject the null hypothesis. We have to find these cutoff values. This is going to be your T lower value. This is going to be your T upper value. So that's our rule for the procedure. And just in case you forgot it, this is the explanation for why that's so. So I did this in another video for us. The rejection regions, remember when we have a not equal to HA, the rule is that if our T value lands here, we reject. If our T value lands here, we reject. And T in this case is either T1 or T2 in this scenario. Okay, now let's go ahead and uh, go to our critical value, or create our table, sorry, and get our critical values finally. Okay, so I'm on the Wilcoxon rank sum table, and I'm looking for 0.05 in two tails, that's this first box of values, and I'm going to N10 for N1, and N is 10 for N2, and we get the values here at the bottom for T lower and T upper to be 79 and 131, 79 and 131. Okay, so we found our T lower critical value to be 79 and our T upper value to be 131. Alright, so those are the values that would go here, right? T lower is 79 and T upper is 131. Now we're going to look at our test stat. Our test stat is 92, right? And when we look at our test stat and see where it lands, you see that 92 is over here. So this is in the do not reject HO area, right? Do not reject HO. Therefore, do not support HA. Our claim, though, is the same as HO. So do not reject is the proper wording here. So we're going to say the sample data does not allow us to reject the claim, right? The sample data, sample data does not allow us to reject the claim. And that's it. Now, of course, whenever you can't reject HO with a non-parametric test, we have to wonder if maybe it's because the test is weaker than a parametric test. But let's try to remember also that, that the Wilcoxon rank sum test is not a, tip, a terribly weak test. It's not as weak as, say, the sign test. So, um, if it doesn't reject HO, perhaps HO should not be rejected based on this data. And perhaps if you used a, say, independent t-test, it wouldn't work any better as far as rejecting HO. We might not be able to re reject HO anyways, even if we had used an independent t-test. Of course, if you wanted to, as just an exercise, you could plug this data into an independent t-test and see what happens if that's the case, if it does in fact um, allow us to reject the claim or not. All right, well, that's the end of the problem, and basically, um, the Wilcox and Ring sum test is a replacement for the independent t-test whenever we can't assume the normality assumptions under the t-test.